Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Sunday morning at 8.30, repeated again at 4.30. You'll also find it at The Voice for Liberty, that's my site at wichitaliberty.org. All the old issue, uh, episodes of Wichita Liberty TV are there, along with all the other content that I and others produce on almost a daily basis. Our guest today is John Fun. He is National Affairs Columnist for National Review and a Fox News contributor. National Review being one of the major pillars of conservative thought and opinion founded by William F. Buckley. Also worked for the Wall Street Journal for two decades before that, serving on the newspaper's editorial board for a period. Some of the books John Fund has written or co-authored include Cleaning House, America's Campaign for Term Limits, Stealing Elections, How Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy, Who's Counting, How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk, and Obama's Enforcer, Eric Holder's Justice Department. So, John Fun, welcome to Wichita thank Liberty you. TV. Thank you. Good to be back here. And very good. And thank you, Carl Peter John, co-host as well. So, as an expert on elections and election fraud and problems going on with that, kind of the, an unfolding story over the past year has been alleged or not Russian involvement in the presidential election of last year. What do we know about that um, so far? And I, I think we don't know a whole lot, I think, as you said before the show, because it's still an unfolding saga. Well, let's start from the big picture and go down to earth. Uh, countries interfere in other countries' elections all the time. Mm -hmm. The best count is the U.S. has interfered in the elections of over 50 countries uh, since the 1950s, and sometimes in very heavy-handed ways. Mm -hmm. uh, other countries have tried to, but because we're so big and powerful, they find it difficult. Uh, the Russians clearly were using social media, they were using disinformation, all the tricks of their trade. Their most visible form of propaganda, of course, is RT, their government-funded television station, which um, has an interesting alternate reality about it. I won't mm -hmm. say they lie, I say they engage in alternate conceptualizations of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, what they actually did, I think, was try to create uncertainty about our election rather than to change the election results. Uh, the hacking that we've heard about, that story has largely been discredited. The story that 21 states saw their election systems hacked, uh, that apparently is largely inaccurate or flawed. Uh, I think that some of their bloggers and some of their hackers might have tried to hack into voter registration systems, which are not election systems. These are just the lists of voters, right. which are public information. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently there was no effort to change those voter registration lists. What they did do was buy some ads on Facebook and other places, try to peddle what is now called fake news stories. Uh, we certainly should be concerned about that. Uh, I'm especially pleased, by the way, that people are finally concerned about the depredations of the Russian authoritarians and dictators because uh, for many years, including the 1980s, uh, I couldn't get people to pay attention uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice, to, it's nice to see them uh, on the side of truth and virtue and paying attention to this issue. We need to pay attention to it, but we need to put it into perspective. There, the election systems we have in this country are highly decentralized. Mm -hmm. Which is probably and a strength, isn't it, it? It certainly is, because the centralized systems that are best known are things like Venezuela, where everything goes to a central mm -hmm. computer and you never know what comes out of it. Uh, our computers in the uh, computer tabulation systems go machine by machine. They don't talk to each other. They're not on the Internet, mm -hmm. which is, I think the Russian example shows us why we don't want Internet voting, at least for many, many decades. Right. Uh, so it's very, very hard to hack into an election system unless you do it machine by machine. Even if you have an insider, it's very difficult to do that. And there's been no evidence that that's ever happened in any um, U.S. election. We do have to have better machines. We probably should have a paper trail of where every election precinct. But the real problem with election fraud is probably old-fashioned vote buying, vote stealing, vote manipulation, both by insiders and by people who are trying to vote more than once or vote if they're not eligible like felons and non-citizens. Mm -hmm. I was asking about uh, when we talk about voter hacking we're talking about actually changing the counts of votes for candidates and the common wisdom is, is that there's no evidence of that happening. But I'm a little bit skeptical because I looked up at the Office of Personnel Management that had their data stolen 
by the Chinese a couple of years sure, ago. Sure, that was a very serious breach. Right. And, and by the way, uh, notice that all the people screaming about Russia are not screaming about China's cyber security yeah. breaches of our system. So they seem to have very selective outrage. But when we hear about these hackings of and like Equifax and Target and all the others, it's oftentimes months or even a year before the company knows that their systems were maliciously accessed. So is that something we should be concerned well, again, about? Each election machine is independent of mm -hmm. the other machines. It's not just one big credit file like Equifax right. or one big personnel file like OPM. So in order to actually change the results, uh, and certainly in theory you can change the results in one machine, how far does that get you unless mm -hmm. it's an extremely close election? Right. And there's also a lot of risk that you're going to be caught eventually because you pretty much need an insider uh, to do that. So how in the world do you do it? Well, remember, if there's a paper trail, and the vast majority of our machines, over 85%, have a paper trail, I think almost I think almost all will have one by the next election. Since there's a paper trail to back up what the electronic count is, if you somehow were able to change the central computers or the central election reporting system, the paper trail would show that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And the paper trail would govern. Very good. Carl, I can tell you've got a question, but we're going to take a moment off for our first commercial break. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with co-host Carl Peter John, our special guest John Fund of National Review. Carl, I think you had a question. Actually, several, but I'll begin with uh, very one of the most famous comments of Joseph Stalin concerning elections was, he didn't care who cast ballots; he only cared who counted the ballots. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some interesting history in the United States on very close elections, and people like to think back to Bush Gore. I actually like to think back to. Texas in 1948 with Johnson and Landslide Coke Stevenson, Linden. Landslide Linden. Don't we have a long history of problems with elections, John, and that, and that this is going to be a perpetual, perpetual challenge no matter what happens or what steps we take? We have two competing philosophies here. Uh, one says that the strength of a democracy is judged primarily by how many people vote. A high voter turnout is a good thing that gives the system legitimacy. The other philosophy says, yes, of course we want people to vote, but we have to take precautions against human nature, which is flawed, um, that some people will cheat the system. And sometimes big mistakes are made through incompetence. So the first group basically says, we don't need any precautions against elections. There's no voter fraud. Uh, bureaucrats don't make big mistakes, s except uh, when they d miss the Russian hacking or something. Mm -hmm. They always make an exception that there's something to worry about. And the other group says, we need common sense reforms to make sure that people are who they say they are. You know, every industrial democracy in the world asks people to show photo, photo ID. ID. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain was an exception, but now they're going to it this year. So every major country takes precautions that some of our states do, but most of our states don't. Uh, we have voter registration rolls that probably 15 to 20 percent of the people on them are either dead, moved out of state, non-citizens, felons, uh, ineligible to vote, and they don't get cleaned up because of all the lawsuits that come from so-called self-anointed civil liberties groups that say you can't take people off the rolls. I think we need common sense reforms. Uh, the vast majority of the American people support that including over 65% of African Americans, of Hispanics, of Asian Americans. Um, in fact, the biggest losers, the biggest victims of some voter fraud are, I think, minorities in big city machines who have bad government, bad schools, bad roads, but they can't change the system because it's run by a corrupt political machine. Mm -hmm. I'd give you Chicago as an example, right. Detroit, St. Louis, Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, Missouri. Thank you. I, I know where I am. And uh, therefore, they're the biggest victims because when they try to challenge the system, the machine, they get crushed often because of voter fraud. I'll give you an example. St. Louis, last August, Democratic primary, state legislature, 32-year-old, very charismatic, college-educated black activist uh, who's part of the Black Lives Matter movement but does, has cooperated with the police in the past. He's reasonable. 
uh, is running against a 69-year-old uh, woman named Hubbard who's part of the political machine. Mm -hmm. He loses the primary because of a flood of absentee voting. But the absentee voting is very suspicious. Comes from very densely packed blocks. Some blocks vote everybody an absentee ballot. Some blocks have hardly any. So they have an investigation. There's enough irregularities that a local judge throws out the election. How mm. often does that happen? Not Declares often. a new election, which is held a month later. Well, in the first election, the incumbent beat the black activist. Both were black, by the way, 51-49. In the second round, same candidate, same district, same you know, fall t voting area time, he won 72% of the vote. Mm. Now, some of that can be explained by their factors. I think a lot of it can be explained by fraud. He sits in the legislature because he had the resources and the lawyers to fight the fraud. But he admitted to me personally, this has happened a lot in St. Louis, and it's one of the reasons we have bad government. So for those who say there is no voter fraud, I say, come with me to St. Louis, mm -hmm. and I'll walk, you, I'll walk through the streets I walked and show you consequences of voter fraud. Bad, corrupt machine government. Now, you mentioned absentee uh, ballots may have been a, or were contributing. They, they were there. the largest factor. So that was voting by mail. Was that how that happened? Or absentee? dropped off at an election facility. But so the point is the ballot is outside the control of and purview of government officials. It's out in the neighborhood. Yeah. So people, spouses can intimidate spouses to vote a certain way. Union officials can intimidate their members. Employers can intimidate their workers. Mm -hmm. So once you have a ballot that's out there, it's no longer a secret ballot because somebody else can look over your shoulder in theory. So is that an argument for less expansive early voting and voting by I mail and so I think we should forth? have early voting. I think we should have absentee voting, but I think it's gotten out of hand. My home state of California has now effectively gone to 75, 80 percent early voting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that creates problems. Oregon and Washington have gone to 100 percent early voting. The problem with it is this, in addition to the enhanced problems of fraud, people are now voting four and five weeks ahead of an election. I know people who vote before the debates are held. Yeah. Why do we have campaigns? It changes the whole dynamic. You know, the Constitution says we have an election day. It doesn't say election month. Right. And of course, it's much takes much longer to count the ballots if they're absentee or early. So now we have a month before the election where people vote. We have an election day, and then in many states we have an election month where they fight for the recounts. This is the only part of our life today that is slower than it was 50 years ago. Yeah. 50 years ago, I used to open the morning newspaper and read the election returns. Now you've got to wait 10 days, two weeks, until all the ballots come trickling in, and then you find out who won a close election. Uh, I think we need to have early voting, but you know, too much of anything can be a bad thing. Yeah, I know Carl's got another question, but we are going to take another commercial break. But before that, I'll say, I've asked people, election officials, what happens if you regret your early vote? In other words, you learned something after you voted, but before the election, that makes you change that. So You're out of luck. that's a complicating thing. So. Give us a moment for another commercial break and we'll be right back. Back to Wichita Liberty TV, I'm Bob Weeks, co-host co co Carl, Carl Peter John, that is, and our guest John Fund of National Review and Fox News. Carl, you had yet another question. Please go ahead. John, as a county commissioner, we served as the sort of the final adjudicator in terms of determining which ballots got counted and which ones weren't when we completed our voter canvas. This whole process has been stretched out, and literally we would have a few races albeit when I was on the commission there were minor races where there were literally ties. Um, I was curious from your perspective to the degree that this whole process gets stretched out, um, what, what could be done in the way of trying to make the system better, more secure, and expedite it than what we're doing today? Because uh, the local media here, particularly our newspapers, have no concern about voter fraud. And we have um, this election process that Bob mentioned. And we start casting ballots three weeks before the election and end up uh, taking about anywhere from a week to 10 days after the election exactly. to do the final count. 
I think absentee voting has to be limited to people who have or claim a legitimate reason. Illness, uh, being out of town, uh, on business. Um, I don't think we should make it onerous, but I think people should give a legitimate reason why they can't show up at the polls. Secondly, I think we need voter ID in every state. I think we need voter ID to make sure that people have more confidence in the integrity of the election. You know, one of the biggest th reasons we get from people in polls as to why they don't vote is, oh, it's all fixed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Donald Trump contributed to that a little bit. And now Hillary Clinton is contributing to it by saying, well, you know, maybe the Russians, you know, change the whole election results so we can't right. consider it legitimate. Uh, voter ID helps make people more confident in their election. And the Supreme Court, in fact, has agreed with that in one of their cases. Lastly, I think that we need to spend more money on the election machines to enhance the confidence level. Every machine should have a paper trail. People expect that now. I also think we need to have a real effort to engage the community again, using the pulse of the high schools and universities, to create a new generation of poll workers. The average age of a poll worker today is almost 70. Mm -hmm. And they're not being replaced. I think we need to give college credit and high school credit to students who will show up and spend a day at the polls. It will be a great exercise in democracy. This is something that's nonpartisan. The b one of the best bulwarks against long lines at a poll or confusion at a polls or simple bureaucratic incompetence is well-trained poll workers. Mm -hmm. And who better than young people who are very cognizant of electronics and electronic com computing equipment yeah. to have them there not to say that 70-year-olds can't use computers, but to have a new generation of people who really know how the system works and how to make it work. That's an interesting thought. Here in Kansas, as you know, we have, um, as our Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, he's a candidate for famous. governor. Yes. Yeah, he's uh, very much involved in some national issues, including election security. A few years ago in Kansas, he, uh, uh, the legislature granted him the power to um, prosecute voter fraud cases in Kansas and I think the count is up to only like 12 or so cases that he's found to prosecute and many of these have been elderly people who voted in two different states some of them thought well I also own property in Colorado I should be able to vote there too. Does anyone really believe they thought that? Uh, well <laughs> I don't no. know. That, look, but if you're voting in two states, you're committing a felony and you mm, know it. Yeah. Don't give me this. Okay, maybe if someone's in a rest home, but, you know, most of those people don't vote anyway. Mm -hmm. Come on. So let's be real. Uh, Chris has made a, only a small number of prosecutions, but the deterrent factor is there. I think that one of the reasons you have laws on the books is not just to catch people, mm -hmm. but to have deterrent. In addition, it's very difficult to prosecute voter fraud. You have to prove intent. Mm -hmm. Now, I just gave you my opinion of an intent, but I'd have to prove it in court, right. which is very difficult, because the person is going to say, oh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. So that's very difficult. So we only prosecute a very, very small number of cases. Frankly, we only prosecute the people who are stupid enough to confess mm -hmm. when they're asked. I think that's been the case. And, and Kobach has made the argument that, uh, you know, you see the cop by the side of the road, you slow down. You know, you, you don't have to get a ticket. In you know, shoplifting in stores falls 30 to 50 percent after a store just does three things. Have a security guard even if he's asleep, have a camera even if it's off, and have a sign that says shoplifters will be prosecuted. If people think there's no risk in an activity, they will do it, mm -hmm. many of them. If people think there's some risk, a whole lot fewer people will do it. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Now let's take our last commercial break here for this episode of Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, Carl Peter John, and John Fun of National Review and Fox News contributor. So later this month in Kansas, we're going to have a hearing on something called ranked choice voting, which is a uh, quite a bit different way of voting. Instead of just checking off a box next to uh, one or two or three candidates, you would actually rank them number one, number two, number three. Um, what are the benefits or perhaps the disadvantages of that type of voting? 
If we were starting our election system fresh, de novo, uh, I think there are some clear advantages. One would be that uh, our current system, even if you have disdain or dislike for a candidate, but they're better than the others, uh, you have to vote for someone you dislike. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't measure subtlety at all. Uh, it's a binary choice, yes or no, on a candidate. Ranked choice voting does have the advantage that you can say, I think this person really has some merit, he's ranked number one. I think this person is a bum, ranked number five, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. However, uh, in changing over, there are a lot of complications. For one thing, it takes a lot of education for people. Uh, you think it's difficult to get people's attention on elections now? Just change the election system and you'll see how complicated right. it is. And I can give you examples from New Zealand and other countries where they took several years to f sort out the kinks of changing an election system in a fundamental way. Uh, in addition, um, I think that we've seen this in mostly college towns, Ann Arbor, Berkeley, places like that, and it hasn't really dr resulted in dramatic change. Mm -hmm. What it has done is I think allowed small, narrow special interest groups to coalesce around a candidate to get the message out that everybody not only has to vote, but you must vote your candidate the first choice. Mm -hmm. So it may exacerbate in some areas, in some places, uh, special interests that have a narrow focus rather than a community-wide focus. I see. So I think there's a whole lot of debate that has to take place. I'm not completely opposed to it, but I think that if you can't explain it in less than 50 words to the average voter, they're going to view it as too complicated. Yeah. And if you can't explain it in less than 25 words to the average legislator, they're <laughs> going to view it as too complicated. <laughs> well, and I think ranked choice voting falls, uh, does have those caveats there. How about you wrote a column, I think, last year about NOTA, none of the above being a, a choice on a ballot. So uh, if you're faced with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and you don't like either of them, you could vote not none of well, the above. Well, yeah, but I don't think Nevada provided much of a none of the above tally in Nothing the 2016 happens. election. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. My none of the above, by the way, was developed when I met a congressman who said, uh, well, what are your election reforms? So I mentioned them, and I mentioned none of the above. He hated none of the above more than anything else, because <laughs> he said, I could lose to an empty chair. And I said, no, <laughs> only if the chair is better. Uh, what, if none of the above were to be on the ballot, what would happen is if none of the above won, beat the other candidates, there'd be a new election, special election, but the candidates who lost none of the above would be ineligible. So the parties would have to put up fresh faces, mm -hmm. fresh people. Now, do I think it's a panacea? Do I think it solves all problems? No, but combine that with term limits, you would have incumbents running scared. Yeah. Because they could lose to an empty chair. Right. So here in Kansas, we have some term limits. We have term limits on our governor, but not on our members of our legislature. Asking a state legislature to vote term limits on itself it's like asking chickens to deliver themselves to Colonel Sanders. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So that's why we need something else I know that you're in favor of is referendum. initiative and referendum. And absolutely. And uh, I've been told that uh, one of the first things uh, that citizens of a state often do when they get this power is to implement term limits. Which is why they're never given the right of initiative and referendum by a legislature. Yeah. So we have none of that. We have some form of initiative and referendum at the city level. Sure. And we actually you turned get back. You for doing that here in the city of Wichita. Yeah, that's happened in I have first-hand experience. So on the initiative and referendum, is there any hope for getting that in a state like Kansas that doesn't have it, do you think? I think you'd need a governor candidate to run and make it one of his top issues. I think you'd have to ask members of the state legislature in that party to say, do you support your governor's candidate's emphasis on this issue? Will you take a stand on it? Are you going to oppose your governor's candidate or support him? Uh, I think you'd have to have a real popular groundswell. But I think a strong governor who campaigned on it and had a mandate and who had a bunch of state legislators elected with him who agreed with him and it said they agreed with him, that could be the avenue. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Carl, you may remember I asked Chris Kobach at the Pachyderm Club. He's been in favor of initiative and referendum. I asked him if he still believed that, and he says yes, but it's never going to happen in Kansas. Wasn't that what he said, I think? Uh, I think that's a fair... Yeah, so... Uh, that's, that's called having the courage of other people's convictions. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think it's, it's practical. I mean, the Ross Perot movement in the 1990s here in Kansas was successful in getting an initiative and referendum proposal through the Kansas House. Yes. But it only passed because the Senate wasn't up and our Senate is on a four-year term basis, right. so they weren't being affected. And I think a lot of the House members voted for it knowing that it was going to go to the Senate. Vote. It was exactly that nothing was going to transpire, yeah. so nothing was going to change. 
and unfortunately uh, that happens sometimes uh, when the chickens get to vote concerning whether they get to visit Colonel Sanders or not. I don't know what the legality of it was, but another way to put pressure on them is to have cities and counties, given their limited right of direct democracy, to have an advisory vote. Oh. Do you think the state legislature should allow initiative and referendum? Mm -hmm. That might be one way to show popular support for the concept. You know, there might be some uh, some merit to that because right now the state legislature has limited the ability of states, cities, and counties to raise taxes, and most of them are pretty mad at the legislature. So maybe they'd be uh, going for that. Well, anyway, some, some county commissions, <laughs> commissioners, and commissions did not agree on that point, Bob. Well, we are out of time for today. So, John Fund, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, very illuminating talk, uh, Carl. Thank you for your input. and thank you for your service, Carl, on the county commission. Thank you, John. And I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. We'll see you again next week.